Okay, so I guess it's time to start. Welcome everybody to this uh, second keynote talk of uh, Gecko 2021 in Lille, quote. Of course, we're we going to are not in Lille, but nevertheless, I uh, want to congratulate the organizers for setting up this conference in spite of the difficult uh, context. Uh, let's hope we can meet, really meet next year. Okay, so let's go to this uh, second keynote. Uh, it's uh, my honor, pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Marc Meza from uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure. Uh, by uh, coincidence, Marc and myself graduated from Ecole Normale Supérieure almost at the same time uh, uh, a few years ago. I will not mention this, uh, <laughs> but Mark uh, is a theoretical physicist while I was a mathematician at that time. Uh, so Mark got a PhD from Economa Superior, he stayed there after graduating. Then he went to Rome uh, with, uh, in a postdoc position with Giorgio Parisi. Uh, then he became head of the statistical physics group in Paris Sud, uh, Orsay. Uh, and closing the loop, he's back uh, as a director of my Superior. Now, Mark's work, and why Mark is here, is because Mark is a pioneer of opening statistical physics of disordered system to computer science uh, from the point of view of information theory. In particular, he established some equivalence between belief propagation and, and the cavity methods. Uh, he got many followers, and this became a, a, a full field on itself. Uh, and we all know that uh, really, big steps in research can be obtained at the border between disciplines. So Mark is really pioneering the border between statistical physics and computer science, in particular also working on uh, case ad problems uh, from the point of view again of statistical physics. Uh, Mark received many awards and distinguished prizes. You can find this on, on the web. Last on, on, on Sager from the American Council of Society, Humboldt Geldersack Prize. Uh, interestingly, Mark got first the bronze not so common. And then he got the Ampere Prize from the French Academy of Science. Uh, Mark also established very strong links between the Italian School of Statistical Physics from his postdoc with Giorgio Parisi. Uh, he speaks perfect Italian. And uh, I've been told that he learned Italian in a Roman traffic while was a postdoc. Uh, <laughs> but now he established really these links. And there are many visiting professors both sides uh, in statistical physics. And I will just end this because Mark has asked me not to be too long and nobody's uh, caring about what I say, what Mark says is important. Uh, my last anecdote is because uh, I happened to bump into the same anecdote from our dear colleague, Smyshek Mikhailovich, and the first lesson of uh, uh, Mark at uh, Polytechnic, statistical physics course at Polytechnic. So I will just ask the question. I hope not to spoil anything from the, from the forthcoming talk. Uh, now, you know that in 44 before Christ, Julius Caesar was murdered by his son Brutus, uh, Moro's son. Uh, and the question is the following. What is the probability that today, when you take a deep breath, you swallow one molecule that was uh, rejected by Julius Caesar in his last breath 2,000 years ago? And the beauty of this question and the answer, of course, is to make people motivated to study the beauty of really, really large numbers. So, Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you. Th thanks a lot, uh, Mark, for this uh, very kind introduction. I will. Uh, I hope that you will uh, not spend the whole lecture. That the public will not spend the whole lecture studying the the, the, the problem that you the challenge that you gave. It's, uh, it's an interesting one. I should say it's, it's a real pleasure to be invited to talk at this, uh, this interesting conference. I just wish that uh, I could, uh, first of all, that it could have been in presence and that I could have attended more of the other talks. But um, anyhow, as, as has been mentioned, my own background is in statistical physics. And uh, statistical physics is this branch of science which studies collective behavior. Basically, the, it tries to bridge the gap between the microscopic description and the, and the macroscopic one. And um, specifically, uh, I think the heart of statistical physics is the emergence properties. That is how collective phenomena emerge 
uh, when you have many atoms in quotation marks, many atoms in presence which interact, and you, you feel that at large scale, there are collective uh, phenomena and that you cannot uh, imagine, that is very hard to imagine if you see only uh, one atom interacting with all the other ones. And so, um, as, as we shall see, uh, these atoms can be very diverse. They could be information bits, they could be signal components, they could be agents interacting on the market. And so, um, basically, statistical physics can get into, into the game whenever you have uh, a, a large number of uh, elementary components which interact. And uh, what I will show is I will try to give you some example of deep connections with uh, statistical inference. Um, as I don't know exactly, I'm not exactly sure of the background of all the participants to this conference, I, I have decided to, to spend a few, to dedicate a few of my first uh, slides to setting the stage so that we have a, a common starting point, let's say, for the, for the rest of the, of the presentation. So I'll start with the question of, uh, of inference, which is a very broad concept used in, uh, in many fields. And, um, and I will briefly introduce the point of view of uh, 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 inference seen from very different point of view. Sorry. So this would be a, a very simple, a very elementary introduction to inference from, uh, from statistics point of view. Basically, you want to infer a hidden rule or you want to find hidden variables from data. So if you take it in a slightly restricted sense, what you will ask is to find the parameters of a probability distribution. So just to be concrete, here would be a, a first year textbook exercise. You have an urn with 10,000 balls, you draw 100 balls find that 70 are white and 30 are black balls. What is your best guess for the composition of the urn? How reliable is this guess? What is the probability that the urn has 6,000 white and 4,000 black balls? So let, me, let us solve together this problem. It's very, very easy. You first assume that there are only black and white balls. You assume that uh, denote the fraction of white balls by X. And then you can say, well, if X is a fraction of white balls, the probability that I pick up exactly 70 white among 100 is, uh, uh, is this uh, uh, number, which is here. You take uh, the log of this number, it's called the log likelihood. And uh, you find that it depends on X as this function. And you find that the most probable value of X, which is a maximum of this log likelihood is 0.7. Well, that's quite uh, obvious. You also get something more. You get what is the probability that X would be 0.6. And it is given in terms of the log likelihood function by, by, this, by this number. So this is uh, extremely easy. Uh, if, if you look at what has been done here, naturally, the natural answer to this question is to do, in fact, some Bayesian inference. In Bayesian inference, you have the unknown parameter X. X would be here, the composition of the urn, the fraction of white balls. You have some measurements here with the outcome of what has come out by drawing 100 balls from the urn. And you have something which is very crucial in Bayesian inference, which is a prior. The prior is what is your prior knowledge on X? And here in the reasoning that I was showing you very briefly before, Implicitly, I was just assuming that I had no knowledge of X, so X would be between zero and one. And I took as a prior just the uniform distribution of X between zero and one. And then there is a famous likelihood. If I know X, what is the probability of a certain outcome? If I know the composition of the urn, what is the probability of getting a certain fraction of white balls when I pick up 100 balls? And you use a simple bias rule in order to, to define what is a posterior, what is the probability of the unknown parameter X given the measurement. And this is proportional to the prior P of X multiplied by the likelihood, the probability of Y given X. So this is very uh, elementary, but we will use it uh, recurrently throughout the talk. And uh, I will now define inference, uh, I mean, give an example of inference in some slightly uh, different fields. 
in uh, AI or in the, the, mo the modern uh, version, which is a machine learning. So imagine that you have the task of, uh, by now the very well-known and very well-solved task of identifying handwritten digits. So you have a picture of a handwritten digit. You throw it through an algorithm and you want the algorithm to tell you what is this digit. Here it is a five. A five. And in machine learning, what you have is that you want to build the algorithm uh, inferring its parameters from examples. So you take a database of examples, like the very famous MNIST database, 70,000 images of digits, very well organized. And you know for each digit, for each image, you know what digit it should be. So this should be a three, this should be a four, et cetera, et cetera. And from this database, basically what you will do is feed, the, is, is train a neural network. So you have a neural network, you have the input layer, which is the image, and then you have a certain number of hidden layers. And uh, each uh, unit in this, uh, each circle here is an artificial neuron. And artificial neurons are, uh, are built by mimicking the natural neuron. In a natural neuron, you have the, the cell body and you have the, uh, the axon. And basically a signal is sent through the axon and, uh, and it is sent to other neurons through the synapses. And so that is what a, an artificial neuron is doing, this neuron here. It will receive signals from the incoming uh, neurons, X1, X2, X3, and it will do a weighted sum. And the weighted sum, it's, it's just W1, X1 plus W2, X2 plus W3, X3. Ws are just mimicking the, synap the efficacy of the synapses. I mean, the synapse that uh, between uh, one neuron and another one, it may be inhibitory, it may be excitatory, it may be strong, it may be weak. It is characterized by one parameter, it's, it's efficacy, W, which is the weight W. So um, basically, a neuron is doing this, this weighted sum and applying a nonlinear function, which could be a sigmoid function or which could be a a ReLU, a rectifying a linear unit function, for instance, if one takes popular examples. So having all this, basically I get back to my, to my uh, machine, which is a neural network. And uh, uh, in, in modern, modern deep learning, you have machines of these types in which uh, you have uh, large images, let's say a megapixel image, for instance, but you have very large networks with hundreds of layers. And, uh, and the, the, the adaptable parameters are all these weights. For each line here, there is a weight, which is synaptic efficacy, synaptic weight, and you have to find it. And uh, so you have millions of weights and, uh, and uh, you have to determine what is the value of these weights, which is well chosen so that in the end, you will have the firing of the very unit, which will tell you this is a five. Okay. So you want to train, the, you want to train the, the deep network by looking at the database and inferring the parameters from data. Here we are dealing with supervised learning. So this is another example of inference. You want to infer all these hidden parameters. But now you see we have inference in an extremely large dimensional space. We have inference in a space of dimension 1 million. So it's, you get into some tricky problems of very large dimensionality. And of course, this is why also uh, we uh, statistical physicists got interested into that because it becomes a, a problem of probability in very large dimension. And then we can, have, we can start to use some of the knowledge that has been accumulated for more than, than a century in, uh, in statistical physics. Uh, my last uh, example of inference will be in information theory. Um, you know that one of the basic uh, process that is being uh, dealt with in information theory is communication. That is, you want to communicate, you want to send a signal, and the signal will be sent from a, a, a sender to a receiver, and it always goes through some channel, some what people call a channel in communication, and this channel is all, always has some noise. So we do that absolutely all the time, every day, uh, many, many, many times. We do that obviously as soon as we want to, to, to give a phone call. Uh, and we give that as soon, sorry, we give that as soon as we write something on, our, on the hard disk of our computer. 
I mean, we have some, some information, you want to type it and it will be processed and sent to the, sent to the disks and it is a communication channel. We also do that as, as soon as we talk to each other or as soon as we teach. In fact, I am using right now a communication channel with you. I'm trying to communicate you some information. And, uh, and also in my channel of communication, there is noise. There is noise because of there is because there is physical noise. Maybe you have you cannot receive very well. I hope it's not the case, but still. And there is noise because with respect to the message that I want to send, maybe I'm not pronouncing correctly or something like that. And so all this noise has to be corrected. And it is part of the activity of our everyday life uh, when we communicate to each other to try to, uh, to get rid of this noise, or at least to, not to get rid of it, but to get around the noise and to convey the message in spite of the noise. And this is done by, by using redundancy. Language is like that. The language that I'm using with you now, um, English, has barely a couple of, 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 um, of bits of information per character. It's very redundant. So it's very redundant. It, it, it helps me it, to communicate with you. Just now, I noticed that I, I said redundant instead of redundant. But you understood. Well, I hope so. You understood because this is the closest word in English. And so you correct it. And this uh, redundancy of the language is, is what makes uh, our life possible and our communication possible. The same way when you talk to a classroom, you will repeat several times the same concept so that people can, can get it and correct errors. So in information theory, in communication theory, basically you have an initial message. Maybe it is an L-bit message. You will encode it in a larger message that will add some kind of redundancy. You send it through a noisy channel. And then you look at the received message and you decode it. And hopefully the decoded message is, a, is the same as the initial one. So let me give you a very uh, simple and well-known example, which is the repetition code. So imagine that I want to send this image through some uh, uh, communication channel. Uh, and uh, the, what I will do in the repetition code is just send it three times. So I take three copies of the image and I send it through the channel. The channel adds some noise. So you see that each image is somewhat blurred. There is a certain level of certain probability of flipping the pixel. And I get these three images. And in this case, the decoding is very easy. What I will do is that I will look at uh, uh, each single pixel. For instance, I take the top, uh, the bottom right pixel here. Here it is black. Here it is white. Here it is black again. I take the majority rule. I say there are two blacks and white and one white. So I suppose that it is black. I do that for every single picture uh, pixel. And you see that I have an image which is better than the one that I would have had without the, the code. So this process of decoding itself is a process of inference. You want to reconstruct the data. You want to reconstruct the image from the signal that you have received. And, uh, and you are doing that by using some kind of uh, statistical inference. So the challenge, of course, I, I was starting to get into that. The challenge is uh, when you have many hidden parameters. That is, for instance, in machine learning with large machine and big data, with decoding in communication, etc. you have many uh, unknown parameters, you have many measurements. And a crucial uh, measure of the difficulty of your problem is what is the amount of data. Uh, and the, typically, this would, that will be given by the number of measurements divided by the number of unknown parameters, alpha. And of course, the problem is harder when alpha is small. And what are the kind of questions that one would like to understand? One would like to get, of course, some algorithm, some inference algorithm that will be able to give you what is the best guess in some, with some kind of, a, of measure, what is the best guess for the unknown parameters. But you could also ask questions about the prediction on the quality of the inference. What is the performance of the algorithms, well, uh, depending on the types of situation where they can be applied. For instance, you could have some, some predictions that tell you if the amount of data alpha is less than a certain threshold, then whatever the algorithm, 
there is no way you can reconstruct the signal. That is a kind of absolute threshold. It is typical of, the, of what Shannon did for communication. Shannon is able to tell you for a given communication channel, if you have a certain level of noise, if the noise is beyond a certain, a certain level, then you will never be able to transfer the information correctly. So these are kind of absolute bounds. And then you can ask uh, performance of algorithms or of specific classes of algorithms. So I will have just uh, two slides with a little bit of formalism, not much. Uh, uh, let me get a little bit into, into it now. So we have the signal. This is a certain number of parameters, x1 up to xn. And I suppose that I have some kind of prior indication on these parameters. Um, you have the measurements. Uh, a certain number of measurements, uh, y1 up to ym, and uh, you have the, the probability of getting a certain measurement uh, given the parameters. This could be a probability, it could also be deterministic in the case where there is absolutely no noise in the measurement. And you do Bayesian inference in which you want to reconstruct the parameters, that is you want to sample them or maybe get the most probable one by looking at the probability of the parameter given the data using bias law. Uh, very often, and uh, uh, I will use this case here for simplicity, we face cases in which the various measurements are independent. So it means that the probability of the whole set of measurements is factorized uh, by a product of probability for each measurement, which is independent of all the other ones. And I will also assume that my, my basic parameters are in, have been written in a, in a basis in which we have a factorized prior. That is, the, the, the prior is just a factorized over each component. So the posterior, the famous posterior, which is here, P of X should be written given Y, is given by the prior times uh, something which is the, the, the piece which is due to the measurements. And this piece due to the measurements, I will write it as exponential of minus a certain energy. This and the energy, of course, is minus log P. So it is a tautology. It is a, an obvious manipulation. Why do I do that? I do that because I was trained as a statistical physicist. And in statistical physics, we are used to the Boltzmann law. And the Boltzmann law, it is a probability distribution in large dimension. You have many parameters, you know, the Avogadro number or number of molecules in a mole 10 to the 23. So we are used to manipulating uh, probability in a space of dimension 10 to the 23. And uh, in this Boltzmann law is written in terms of the energy as exponential minus the energy. And so this uh, EMU, which is here, which is minus log of the probability of the measurement is like the energy in statistical physics. So um, this is our problem. It is a problem of statistical physics. It is uh, often uh, useful to describe it uh, in uh, uh, using the language of uh, computer science graphically by saying we have the variables. These are these circles here. And they, these variables, they have several uh, constraints. One of them is the uh, basic prior probability distribution, which are the green squares. And the other are the probability induced by the measurements. And so if I have a measurement mu, and here I have assumed that it involves all the four variables, so it will put some global constraints on the four variables. And this constraint is of a probabilistic nature. So in terms of, in terms of statistical physics, um, this is a, a case in which we have our variables. They can be discrete or continuous. They interact, they interact through this energy function that I was describing before. And this energy function, it could be either, for instance, in simple case, pairwise, or it could be multibody interaction. And uh, what you find here is that there is a, a disordered system, basically, because for ev every measurement, it will give you a different energy. And so this is an example of what people call statistical physics of disordered systems. And what we will be interested in is the thermodynamic limit in which we have a large dimension, the number of xi's n becomes very large, 
the number m of measurements become very large too, and the ratio is fixed. So this is what is called the thermodynamic limit. And our experience in, in, in statistical physics tells us that there can be very weird behavior in this, in this large scale limit, in particular phase transitions that is varying a small parameter, you can have completely different microscopic behavior. Uh, in our uh, own language, in our terminology, this is called a spin glass. So this is a spin glass. These are variables that interact. They have uh, uh, various types of interaction and they are disordered. And uh, spin glasses, I will do a short parenthesis so that you have some, uh, some idea of why, you, why we got into this, this field in the very broad field uh, many years ago. Spin glasses are disordered magnetic systems. They are uh, alloys, like for instance, manganese and copper. You put 1% of manganese impurities into copper. The manganese, they take some random position and they don't move. The manganese impurities have a spin, they have a magnetic moment, the copper does not have it. So the magnetic properties are due to the manganese. And basically these spins, they can point up or point down. They are just two, two, two level variables. And um, it turns out that uh, the interaction between this magnetic moment is pairwise and the energy is just the sum of all pairs of a certain uh, uh, coupling constant, Jij, times the spin of impurity I, the spin of impurity J. And depending on the distance between two impurities, Jij can be positive or can be negative. And so you see that uh, if you look at this probability distribution, if I have a pair with a positive Jij, the, the, the Boltzmann weight exponential minus E divided by temperature will favor the, the cases in which the impurities are in the same direction. But if J is negative, it will favor the cases in which the impurities point in opposite direction. So this creates uh, the, the notion of what is called frustration. You cannot satisfy all local constraints simultaneously. It is also disordered because each spin sees a different local field. And uh, uh, this uh, frustration effect that you can look at, for instance, imagine that you have three spins and they all have a negative interaction, it means that each interaction favors opposite pointing of the spins, but you cannot have three spins pointing two by two in opposite direction on a triangle. So this is a frustrated, a frustrated system. From the point of view of computer science, it is also a, a typical uh, example. It is a NP hard problem. It's very difficult to find the ground state, the minimum of this energy. Uh, what has been found, uh, this, these problems have been uh, seen as interesting in physics since uh, 1975 or in the 1970s. And um, initially, the phenomenology was very strange. The measurements were not, like, not at all like the usual uh, magnetic system. And gradually, we have built up an understanding of what is happening in, in spin glasses. And very roughly speaking, what one can say is that it is a very high dimensional problem. You have a system with 10 to the 20 spins. So it's in a configuration space of dimension 10 to the 20. I'm projecting it here on one dimension. So it is extremely misleading. But still, what we find is that the energy function is extremely shaky. And if you want to find the minimum of the energy, uh, it, is, it is very difficult because you have many quasi-minimum, many quasi-ground states in our language. They are not related by symmetries, and they also have many metastable states. So it induces a very slow dynamics, aging properties. I mean, these systems in which the elementary time scale is 10 to the minus 13 seconds, they age over days and months. So the, the, the time scale of the evolution of such system is extremely slow. So this is just this was just a small parenthesis to, to tell you about uh, spin glasses and in some sense we've made a connection between the communities of, of physics and uh, some aspects of computer science. And now I want to go back to, to inference. And uh, I will give you one concrete example of, exa uh, of inference and its relationship to the, to the physics of glasses. Um, this example is a tomography of binary mixture. So imagine that you have a sample. It, has a, it is made of a, a, a 
two uh, phases, phase A and phase B. It could be copper and manganese, it could be whatever. And uh, uh, you want to find it. And how you find it? Basically, you have a sample. And a typical experiment that you can do is go to a synchrotron uh, nearby next to you. And, um, and you in the, in the synchrotron, you, you shine light on your sample and you measure the light which is getting through. So basically you measure the absorption coefficient. And if you suppose that the white phase and the black phase, they don't have the same absorption power, then basically each measurement here on each pixel on this screen, you will have an indication on the sample, which is what is the proportion of white and black along this way. Of course, from this single measurement here, you cannot reconstruct the composition because you, can, you cannot say if the black are all in one, one side or etc. So what you need to do basically is to make measurements at various angles. Of course, here I, I should say I am, I am showing the, the picture on one slice of my sample. You, you should do it in parallel for many slices, of course, if you have a bulk sample. So what you do is that you turn your sample around in the synchrotron light and you do it basically L angles. So if the resolution is that on each measurement you are doing, on each uh, picture you are doing L measurement for the slice and you do L angles, then you are, you are performing L square measurement. And with this L square measurement, you can reconstruct the L square pixel. Basically, this is called, this is the absorption is just a linear measurement. So you can do the inverse of this linear measurement. It's called the inverse radon transform. In this case, it can be done exactly. And that's what people do. That's how they infer the composition of a sample. But for that, you need to do basically L square measurement to measure the L square pixels. Now, imagine that your sample is such that the, the, the pixel size is one, but the domain size, the typical size of, of, of a domain here, Xi, is much larger than one. Then you have, and the full size, of course, of the sample is L. Then you see that uh, the information in this picture it is not of the order of L square bits. It's much less than that. Because basically, if you take a single pixel with, with large probability, you take it randomly, with large probability, the neighboring pixels are the same color. So uh, this is a, said in other phrase, in other terms, this image can be compressed, can be compressed quite significantly if the domain size, size is very large. For instance, you could de describe it by by, uh, by uh, monitoring the, the position of the boundaries instead of addressing the image from the pixel point of view. So the question of tomography uh, and of compressed sensing basically is the following one. Can you, um, is there a way to reconstruct this image by doing much less than L square measurements? Uh, it turns out that uh, it can be done. Uh, for instance, for this image here, digitalized on, a, on a, a 1 million pixel grid, uh, the, the, the standard Radon transform approach would tell you, you need to measure 1000 angles. And here it can be reconstructed from only 16 angles. So with a speed up of a factor 60. So this is a lot. And this has been uh, studied uh, quite, uh, quite a lot. How do you do that? Let me give you a little hint of how it can be done. Well, basically at the level of single pixels, what you do is that you have a binary variable SI, which can be either one or minus one, depending on whether it is a white phase or the, or the black phase. And each measurement here, it corresponds to a stripe. And the measurement tells you what is the sum of SI on all these stripes. And here, so this is what you have. This is the, the, what you measure. What else can you use? Well, you can use a prior. And the prior in this case is that you know that you are doing a measurement on an alloy of black and white. And this alloy, you might know that it is not uh, a completely mixed phase, but it is a phase in which you have domains. So this will tell you that neighboring pixels are more likely to be equal. 
So this would be the prior that you could say. You can say whenever you have two variables, SI and AJ, which are neighboring neighbors on the grid, there is a, a, a factor E to the J SISJ, which favors the fact that SISJ is positive. So you look at this probability distribution. It's a set of uh, uh, 1 million spins, let's say. You have this prior, which is called the easing prior in, uh, in, in physical language, and you have the measurements. And uh, this is a typical statistical physics uh, problem. What you want to get from that is what is the most probable value of, of a given spin. And this you can study with, uh, with means field uh, method. Uh, and I will come back to it. If you have enough, the outcome of that is that if you have enough measurements, the most probable S, the ground state of this spin system, gives the perfect composition of the sample. So you can reconstruct the sample. That is what I was telling you. With only 16 measurements, you can reconstruct completely the system. So why is it? It turns out that you have an optimal configuration, which is the, 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 the configuration, the real one from which you did the measurement, from which you got this white. And you want to, it turns out that if you have enough measurement, this, what I call the crystalline configuration, the one that, that you got the measurement from, it becomes much more probable than, uh, than the other ones. So uh, you basically what you are hunting is this crystal, this crystal which is uh, the most probable phase. And uh, crystal hunting is not very easy because uh, so you will have one configuration which is more likely than all the other ones, which, are, which has lower energy, but it may be hidden. It is in general hidden in a very large dimensional space. And so uh, the whole question of uh, inference in large dimension will be to try to infer this configuration uh, by not getting uh, trapped, not getting fooled by all these local minima of the, of the energy landscape. This can be sometimes computationally very hard. One uh, uh, typical uh, method that has been used in order to achieve that uh, is the use of mean field methods. Mean field methods have been develop, developed for decades in, uh, in statistical physics, but we will see also in other fields. And, uh, and it is a kind of generic, uh, uh, generic method that uh, develops under the name of uh, message passing, belief propagation, survey propagation, etc. And here I would like to give you some idea, some general idea of uh, these uh, of these mean field uh, methods, uh, how they were developed and how they can be useful. Um, a brief uh, note on the historical development of mean field equations. In in physics, this was done for um, homogeneous at first for the study of ferromagnets by Curie and Weiss, basically by Weiss. Uh, and then it was improved in the 30s by uh, Hans Better and Rudolf Peyers. Then there were the developments which are, have to do with glassy systems, with disordered systems. And um, all this was more on the theoretical side. Uh, mean field was used as a tool in order to um, infer what is the collective behavior of a system of spins that interact in the very large size limit. Uh, it turns out that it can also be used as an algorithm. And uh, for us in physics, it took us quite a long time to understand that because, because we did not uh, ask ourselves questions in terms of algorithms. But um, as an algorithm, mean field uh, equation based algorithms have been developed in other contexts first. Uh, the first one that I know is, uh, is, um, is Gallagher. Uh, Gallagher. Uh, invented a set of error correcting codes based on low density parity check codes. And the decoding for that, I told you that it is an inference process. It is, so you want to analyze this famous large dimensional probability distribution of the, of the variables. And he, he, he proposed as a decoding algorithm, the use of what we would call here mean field equations or belief propagation. Uh, independently, Judy Pearl in 1986 uh, proposed the BP algorithm itself. It is uh, very closely uh, related. And uh, um, only relatively late, we got interested in uh, 
in uh, using the mean field equations for uh, decoding and in particular uh, the physics of glasses came into the game and uh, it gives some uh, extra um, sophistication to the to the to the message passing algorithm uh, that I will try to describe uh, rapidly uh, later on. So let me describe to you the basic uh, message passing algorithm, which would be the belief propagation algorithm. And uh, I, will, uh, I will use BP because it has the advantage of being also the initial of Beto and Piles. And uh, from, at least from the point of view of, of physics, uh, Beto and Piles had written some kind of equation of this type in the 30s. So this is the BP. So imagine that I have a certain set of variables. Here are five variables, x1 up to x5. And uh, the probability joint probability distribution is based on a product of factors. So there is a factor A, which is a, a, a positive function of x1, x2, x4. Uh, B is a function of x2 and x3. And here I have the factor graph, which tells me what variables appears in what factor. So this is a very general uh, setup in which you will be able to formulate a lot, uh, a lot of problems. Of course, in our case, we will be interested in the case where uh, the variables can be 1 million variables, for instance, in machine learning, or maybe 10 to the 20 if you, if you use uh, spin glasses. 10 to the 20, I will not address the question of algorithms, as you, as you can understand. But 1 million, yes, we can address the question of algorithms. So BP is written in terms of messages. And these messages, you can see them by looking at the probability distribution of a, of a slightly modified problem. Imagine that I look at the modified problem in which I have my same, my same problem as before, but I erase one of the factors. And so uh, imagine that I would be able to compute the probability of x1 in the absence of factor A. This, I call it the message 1 to A of x1. And another type of message is uh, now I am taking one variable, x1, and I am erasing all the factors to which it is connected by one, but one. I keep only the factor c. And imagine that I am able to compute the probability of x1 in this new modified model in which it is connected to the rest of the other variables only through c. And uh, here I will get the probability of x1 when it is connected only to c. I call it m c to 1 of x1. Uh, and uh, BP connects all these uh, messages uh, in the following way. So here is a message m c to 2 of x2. It is a probability of x2 when it is connected only to c. Well, then that is relatively simple. You should look at the possible values of x1 and x3, sum over all these probabilities, put the factor which represent the interaction between variable 1, 2, and 3. This is a factor of psi c of x1, x2, x3. And then uh, put the probability of x1 in the absence of c. This is m1 to c. And the probability of x3 in the absence of c. This is m3 to c. The second type of message, M1 to C, it is basically uh, estimated as just, so M1 to C was the probability of X1 uh, in the absence of C. And so it means that X1 is connected only to the factors D, E, and F. And so it is just the product of the weights on X1 induced by D, by E, and by F. So these are the BP equations, basically, on uh, each edge of the graph, you will have uh, uh, two messages that are being sent. So uh, if you have a, a E edge of the graph, you will have two E messages. And these messages, you can, they, they obey some local rules, which are the rules that I was writing before. Sorry. Which are these rules here? So it is it is very simple, very elementary, and very generic. And as I was telling you, this kind of idea has been developed independently in several branches of science, and probably in other ones that I that I don't even know. Um, so the, the the idea of BP is to find these messages. Uh, then, well, you can you can ask: Is this a, a correct method or not? If you, if you look at it a bit more closely, I was flashing it fast, but if you look at it a bit more closely, 
these equations in general they are not exact they did something which was which was weird at some point that when i when i write the message from c to 2 i say this is the probability of x2 this is x2 uh, due to 1 and 3 and i say it's easy because there is only one factor so i sum over x1 x3 the weight times times what times this should be the joint probability of x1 and x3 in the absence of c and I have assumed that it is factorized, that it is the probability of X1 in the absence of C times the probability of X3 in the absence of C. So I have assumed that there were an independence of these two variables, one and three, in the absence of C. So immediately, if you realize that, you also understand the range of validity when BP is exact. It is exact if this factor graph, which describes this interaction, is a tree. Because if it is a tree, if I take out C, then it is true that x1 and x3 are independent. It turns out that it, all, it is also exact on locally tree graph like. That is, if the factor graph is locally tree like, for instance, a Nerdoschrenny graph with finite average connectivity, uh, then if the correlations decay fast enough, at least you will have uncorrelated uh, variable and BP will be exact. So, and it is also exact in, in places where you have uh, infinite range in interaction, that is every variable interacts with everybody, but the correlation should be fast enough. So um, one small parenthesis, I will not elaborate much on it because it can become quite technical, but in our case, uh, we were very much interested in cases to in trying to apply these mean field methods to cases of where there is a glass phase. And uh, uh, if you have glass phase, you have uh, this very shaky energy landscape. It turns out that if you restrict the measure to the neighborhood of one minimum to what we call one valley, then uh, you will have locally for this uh, minima here, you will have one solution of the BP equation. The BP equation will be exact and there will exist one solution. But the, the very uh, essence of the glass phase is that there are many states, there are many valleys, there are many solutions. And basically what you do in this case is that you can do, you can do look, <coughs> sorry, you can look at a more sophisticated message, which does the statistics of the previous BP message over all the possible states of the system. So this is a function of the message. This is its distribution of the message. And that is called survey propagation. And that is a, an algorithm that we uh, found with, uh, with uh, Jekina in 2002, uh, following also some, um, some developments I did with, uh, with Parisi just before. And, um, and this uh, survey propagation algorithm becomes quite uh, um, uh, efficient for very complicated problems. So, these message passing algorithms in general, they are really smart. They can provide an approximate solution, in some cases exact solutions, of very hard and very, very large constraint satisfaction problem. They also run very fast. Typically, they will run in linear time. And just to mention that BP is among the best decoders for some large class of error correcting codes. Survey propagation is the best solver for random satisfiability problems in the hard region close to the SAT and SAT transition. Uh, BP is used for learning patterns in neural networks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It is based on local, simple update equation, and uh, it is a very distributed, uh, really distributed algorithm that solves a hard global problem. And it has its connections to to neural networks, which I find also interesting. Um, to, to show you one concrete application of the use of BP, I will uh, uh, go now to a, a concrete example, which is uh, compressed sensing. Uh, compressed sensing is, is a relatively recent development uh, of information theory in the last uh, uh, 10 years or 15 years. And uh, it has a lot of applications in uh, tomography, in uh, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, single pixel camera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, basically the, the main idea is relatively easy. It goes back to this idea of compression. That is, if you take this image and uh, you look at its uh, decomposition in terms of wavelets, 
uh, that is you basically change basis for, for uh, describing the picture. So in the wavelet basis, you will see that there are a few coefficients which are large, but a lot of them are not, uh, are not large at all. And if you put to zero the small wavelet coefficients, you get this other image, which to your eye does not, uh, it's not, uh, there is no difference. Right? So this is one of the basic uh, tools for data compression that you are using uh, every day as soon as, as soon as you put a, a, a photo on your, on your laptop, for instance. The, the question of compressed sensing is, can you acquire the data directly in a compressed way? Is there a way that you can uh, directly go to the right basis, get rid of these coefficients which are very small and only focus on the relevant coefficient? So this is important, for instance, if you, if you think in terms of, uh, of uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. Uh, if you are able to do that, it means that you spend much less time in the, in the NMR machine. So that is a, uh, that has a lot of practical implications also. So some kind of very abstract uh, but but relevant uh, uh, compressed sensing description is, is the following: You have a signal X. Uh, it has n component x1 up to xn, and you know that the signal that you are seeking is is sparse. That is, you know that among these n components a fraction of them is, is actually zero. But you will want to find which are zero and which are non-zero, and what is the value of the non-zero ones. Then you do some measurement, and here I will keep to the case in which the measurements are linear. So I do M measurements. Each measurement is a linear combination of the signal. So the measurement is described by your M times N matrix. M is the measurement, N is the number of unknowns. And uh, I have this, uh, this matrix. And I will focus here on the case of what is called random projections. That is, F is a random matrix, which is not coherent with the signal. And the question is, of course, and the measurement could have noise. I have not written it explicitly here. But it could be, for instance, additive noise, y equal fx plus noise. But even if we think in terms of the pure case, of the noiseless case, imagine you have this problem. And I tell you now, I do a certain number of measurements, m, but m is less than n. So I mean, it means that I have linear measurements in number which is smaller than the number of unknowns. Uh, can I reconstruct the signal? Of course, if I would not have any indication on the signal, if I would not have any prior on the signal, I would not be able because I don't have enough equations. I have less equations than unknown. So I know that the problem is underdetermined. But if I know that X is sparse, and basically if I know that the number of non-zero components of X is smaller than the number of measurements, then there is a way to reconstruct the signal. And the way, I mean, I can tell you just in words what would be the algorithm. You just do um, some exhaustive search. That is, uh, imagine that I suppose that there are only uh, R variables which are non-zero. So I first guess, I first say, imagine that these are the variables X1 up to XR. Now, I have now more measurements than, than unknown variables. All the other ones have been put to zero. So my variables are x1 up to xr. I put that in the system. And I have an over-constrained linear problem. So if my choice, if my guess was right about the non-zero variable, then I will find that my over-parameterized system is consistent, that there are several measurements which are linear combination of each other. And then it means that I have the right guess. Otherwise, I choose all the, I, I test all the other guess. So it means that by enumeration, I can solve this problem. I can solve this problem in this following limit. Here I am describing the thermodynamic limit. I have n variables, n is much larger than one. The number of non-zero variable is R, which is rho times n. The number of equations is M, which is alpha times n. So the simple uh, algorithm that I was showing before tells you that as soon as alpha is larger than rho, you can solve, you can reconstruct the signal, but it takes an exponential time because of course I have to look at all the possible 
choices of what are the non-zero variables among the n ones. Instead, what has been uh, proposed uh, in particular by uh, by uh, Candace and Tao, Donoho, Donoho, Tanner, et cetera, around 2005, 2006, was instead to use an optimization approach in which you optimize your L1 norm. That is basically what you, will, what you want to do is to find X, which satisfies all the equations. So it means that it is in the subspace spanned by these equations. But you want to minimize its L1 norm. That is the sum of absolute value of Xi has to be minimal. Because absolute value of Xi, it is a function that, has, that is pointing towards zero, you will naturally get by minimizing the L1 norm, you will get that some of the values of Xi will be zero. So you will get from that the, uh, the variables that are zero. So this is not exact, it's a substitute. But at least it has a virtue, which is that uh, finding, minimizing the L1 norm with the linear constraints is a convex problem. So it can be solved uh, easily and fast. So this is a kind of, of benchmark. Uh, what we did with, with my uh, collaborators on, on this problem is, is rather, instead of using this minimization with the L1 norm, which is only approximate, of course, it is to use the Bayesian approach. That is, you have. The, you want to look at the probability of X given the measurement. So you have the constraints due to the measurements and you put a prior and your prior will be the main part of the prior is to say with probability one minus rho Xi is equal to zero. That is the sparsity. And with probability rho Xi is something. And there I put some kind of prior. It could be a uniform on an interval. In practice, what we did was to use a, a Gaussian prior. So we use what is called the Gauss-Bernoulli prior, that is with probability one minus rho, Xi is zero. With probability rho, it is drawn from a normal Gaussian distribution. So this is, this P of X here, is a problem of statistical physics. You can use the mean field method, you use the beta method, you look at the message passing and you analyze it. And you can do all that using these tools, which is called basically the cavity method of statistical physics, which I will not describe. And using that, you can get the phase diagram. What is the phase diagram? Phase diagram is described in terms of two parameters. Rho is the density of uh, uh, non-zero uh, variables. Alpha is the density of measurement, uh, m divided by m. And what I told you is that as soon as alpha is larger than rho, in principle, this, the, the problem is solvable. You have enough data to reconstruct the signal. Uh, you have enough data, but it is very slow. It is an exponential algorithm. It is the, the enumeration one that I was looking at uh, before. Uh, what, uh, what was done for the L1 norm minimization is the identification of this phase transition. This phase transition tells you if you have a number of measurement which is above, which is greater than this line, then you will be able to reconstruct the signal exactly. Below that, this line, you will not be able. So there is a sharp phase transition in the large end limit. And what we found is that using the um, Bayesian approach with the belief propagation, uh, we have this other phase transition here, and it improves. That is, we are able to solve the problem with less measurement than the one that is needed for L1. This is the case in which we had some good uh, guess, we had some good prior, that is, this is a case in which uh, the, the signal itself, the, the non-zero component of the signal were generated through a Gaussian. And as we are using a, a Gaussian prior, it means that we have a prior which fits well with the reality of the signal. So that is a relatively uh, easy case. On the contrary, if we have a binary signal that is non-zero component of the, of the signal are plus or minus one, and we don't know that, and we use a Gaussian prior, then basically our phase diagram with BP is more or less the same as the one with L1. So what we find typically with the, the, the Bayesian approach and the belief propagation approach is the following phase diagram. 
This is written in terms of uh, one over alpha. One over alpha is the number of unknown divided by the number of measurements. So if you have uh, uh, too, too few measurements or many unknowns, it is impossible to reconstruct. If you have uh, many measurements, uh, then it becomes easy to reconstruct. And, uh, and there is an intermediate phase. So there are two phase transition. This one between impossible and hard is the ultimate information theoretic threshold. It would be the Shannon threshold in some sense. And this one is an algorithmic threshold. This one tells you here in this regime, I have enough measurement and the BP is able to find the solution with probability one. Here, I know that there should be a way to find a solution, but BP is not able to find it. And actually, what we know, this is just experimentally, so far there is no real proof of that, is that in this, at this threshold here, there is no uh, uh, local algorithm and no polynomial time algorithm which is able to uh, find the, uh, to find the solution in this hard regime. And the physics of it is the following. Uh, in the easy regime, you have an energy landscape, which is easy. You have this zero energy, which is a crystal, the one that you seek, and it is easy to find. It is a kind of broad valley. You will find it by whatever method that you want to, to use. You could use a simulated annealing, for instance, would work. In the hard phase, you don't have enough information. You will never make it because actually there are many possible configurations which have zero energy, which are compatible with all the constraints. So this is just impossible. In the intermediate phase, we know that there is the perfect reconstruction of the signal, the famous crystal, but it is hidden. It is in, hidden in large dimensional space. And we have many, many metastable states, which are the glass state. So uh, conjecture is that this transition has a meaning beyond BP and uh, that it is much more universal than that, but it is only at the level of conjectures. Um, so let me uh, now point at one development of that idea, because when you have this, this landscape in, uh, in mind, basically you can uh, get around this, you, you understand that what is trapping the algorithms are these glassy states. And uh, one way of getting around the glass trap is to design the matrix so that one can nucleate the, nat the, the native state, the crystal. And uh, this, is, this is an idea of crystal nucleation. It's very uh, straightforward in physics in some sense, but it was in this context, it was first invented in error correcting codes. And it is what I call the seeded BP. I will not show that. The seeded BP, or maybe I show it, but uh, then I have to. This, this, is a, this is super cool water. So you have a metastable phase. And what you do is that you drop a, a bit of crystal in the bottle and uh, it, will, uh, it will crystallize basically. And it will crystallize by a, wa a wave of crystallization. And um, this is what you can do. You can uh, uh, tailor, if you are smart enough with the measurement, you can tailor the measurement as follows. Basically, you will say that uh, you will have a first block of measurement, which will involve many, uh, uh, many variables. That is, you have the first block in which you have an effective number uh, of variables involved in the block, which is the same, uh, the same number of variables as the size of the block. So you have enough, enough information. You are sure that for these variables, you will be able to decode them. And then you have other blocks in which you have less measurements than variables. But you will use the fact that you are able to decode easily the first block in order to induce a wave of crystallization in the, in the system. And uh, that is what you can see in, uh, in such a system. This is the block index, and this is the performance of the algorithm measured by the mean square error for each block of variables. And what you find is that at, uh, at uh, early times, of course, you don't decode anything, but as soon as you have uh, four or five in uh, four or 10 interaction of BP, the first block is decoded exactly. And the second one also, the other ones are bad, but then you, what you see is a wave of crystallization. And from that, you can re reconstruct the signal perfectly and you can reach this absolute, this ultimate Shannon threshold. 
So basically, you can decode all the way in the forbidden phase here, in the hard phase. But this is because you have been able to invent some special measurement that are uh, where you are able to where you are able to reconstruct. So you have a better reconstruction algorithm. So this is an example of application. This uh, is uh, an image. Uh, this uh, um, alpha tells you what is the level of noise. Alpha, a small alpha tells that there is a lot of noise. And you see that if you take the L1 norm the minimization, it is perfect at alpha equal 0.6, but when noise increases, it degrades. And um, the, in Wavelet, the sparsity of these images is around uh, one quarter. And so basically the theory tells you that there should exist an algorithm that is able to decode perfectly when the noise level is uh, uh, below, when, when the number of measurement is, uh, is alpha larger than 0.24. And so here we are far from it. This is the BP. BP improves a little bit on L1, but is not perfect. But with the seeded BP, we're able to make it all the way through uh, the whole phase diagram and down to uh, this number of measurements, which is 0.24. So um, the main message that I want to convey here is this existence of various regimes in which there is an easy regime in which you can basically many algorithm will find the solution and BP is a smart one that runs fast. There is an impossible regime and there is in between the hard regime in which you really need to do something more. In some case, it can be survey propagation. In this case, it will be uh, tailoring the matrix of measurement so that you are able so that you are able to make it. I see that uh, I am uh, running nearly to the 60 minutes, so I will uh, not show the, the application to decoding, or maybe I, I, I run through it just through the slide. These are this is an example of error correcting codes with parity equations. That is the uh, the constraints are parity equations, the constraint between the variables. And, um, and basically what you get when you do the uh, um, decoding with, uh, the, there is an optimal threshold for decoding and there is an algorithmic threshold if you decode with belief propagation or what is called iterative decoding, which is the name of BP in this field. So you have this two phase transition again, an algorithmic one, and uh, an absolute geometric phase transition. And you get the same thing, easy, going to hard, going to impossible. So you have a geometric representation of what is taking place. I will not go into this geometric representation. I will just uh, conclude. Um, basically, um, as I was saying at the beginning, myself, I went into this whole field by, by studying spin glasses. It is amusing because spin glasses were seen by physicists in the early 80s as something very strange, very weird, and uh, basically it did not have any application. And still now, nobody has found an application. In spite of the pressure, you know, to find application to something for writing or gr your grant proposal, for instance. Actually, there were very few grants on spin glasses because of that. But still, it was triggering the curiosity of many people because it was some uh, this sophistication, this very rich behavior of spin glasses, the experimental one that I did not have time to, to really go through in detail, but this very rich landscape that I was presenting. Uh, and, and then there is a whole corpus of methods that has been developed. I have touched a little bit uh, the cavity method. There is also the replica method, which is a, another very nice method. And all this was developed in these years between the 1975 and 2000. And it turns out that later on, they, it was understood that this spin glass method and this, some of the concepts could be interesting in some other problems in computer science, in information theory, uh, in statistics. And so I like this idea. Uh, Phil Anderson had described the spin glass as a cornucopia, this, this uh, object uh, here. And I am uh, very fond of this cornucopia. I think that it is indeed a cornucopia and it has found now applications in many different fields of information theory and computer science. And so it's a good example, I, I think, of uh, um, uh, why it is difficult, of how it is difficult to guess where interesting scientific development will find an application in the end. 
Thanks a lot for, for your attention and I am ready to take uh, questions. Of course. Oh, thank you very much, very much, Mark, uh, for this uh, very clear pedagogical talk about uh, statistical inference. So it's time for questions. Uh, yes, I will try to leave my camera off because of my unstable connection, sorry. So there were more than 200 attendants uh, during the whole talk, so that's uh, really very nice. Uh, I don't know how to take questions from the attendants. No, nobody seems to raise hand. There's a question in the chat, though, or oh, two questions now. So first question uh, by Geoffrey Prevost. It was mentioned that the BP equations lead to very good SAT solver for random SAT instances. Random SAT instances follow a concrete probability distribution. Does a change in the probability distribution of the SAT instances affect the algorithm based on the BP equations? Yes, this is uh, this is an excellent question. In fact, uh, BP and and um, above all uh, survey propagation SP uh, is is a very good uh, uh, algorithm for solving random set problems because it was invented for that. But uh, it is not uh, not always robust to changes in the set formula, and uh, in the sense that if you if you try to use it. On, um, on set formula which are not random at all, it may fail, it may not converge and so on and so forth. And I think that this is a kind of uh, interesting, um, it touches on a very, on a very important uh, aspect of the interface between statistical physics and uh, development in computer science. Statistical physics, basically it is, um, it is based on analyzing ensembles of problems. That is, you will have a certain ensemble described by your probability distribution. So for instance, random three set formula. Okay, with a certain density of clauses. That is a well-defined ensemble. And then, and then you can start to do statistical physics. It's exactly what we do when we have also a random instance of spin gases. It is not, statistical physics is not uh, built in order to uh, address questions of what is the worst case issue. It will tell you what is the typical behavior for a typical instance of uh, taken from an ensemble. That is, you take a typical instance of random three sat, and that is how um, BP or SP will behave. And it will tell you what is the solution, that's it. But it will not, it will not give you any information on the worst case. Uh, initially, in the in the 1980s, there were some uh, vague ideas that maybe uh, the, the appearance of glassy face would be related to NP completeness and so on. And they think that um, it is clearly not the case, and it is intimately related to this uh, very different kind of question. You have uh, in in physics, you will you will you will want to answer typical questions. What, what is the behavior of a typical instance? You never work in terms of worst case. In computer science, at least if you are interested in complexity, you will be interested in worst case. But uh, nevertheless, I think that uh, with um, there are many interesting questions that you can see, that you can look at by looking at uh, typical case analysis. And also you can, you can get a very detailed uh, a description of, uh, of what is taking place. For instance, in satisfiability, uh, looking at random satisfiability uh, formulas, what we found is that just below the Saturn sat threshold, if you are a little bit less close than the Saturn sat threshold, there is a shattering of the space of configuration. That is the, 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 the assignments of the variables which solve all the constraints, which are compatible with all the constraints, they become clustered in very, in very far away clusters in phase space. So you have this geometric picture, and I think that uh, this is in itself a very uh, interesting hint of what can make satisfiability difficult. And this hint, you can try to use it in, uh, in other cases, which are not just the random set formulas. OK, thank you. Uh, we still don't have questions, direct questions, only in the chat. Remember, you can ask direct questions by raising hands. Uh, the next question in the chat is a bit related to what you just said, uh, Mark. So it's my Marcus Gallagher. 
Thanks for the very interesting talk. Are you aware of any work that has studied the experimental behavior of BP on problem instances close to the phase transition, they, like constraint satisfaction, satisfiability? Yes, there is. Um, yes, yes, there, there is quite a lot of uh, attention uh, of uh, what how BP is behaving when you get close to the phase transition. Typically, uh, BP will be um, will, will have its algorithmic threshold, and in the case in which we have random SAT instances, let's say we can uh, predict what is the value of its threshold. That is. Uh, and basically what will happen is that when the number of clauses exceeds a certain threshold, which is itself below the SAT and SAT threshold, when it exceeds it, then BP will, say, will stop to converge. BP is an iterative algorithm. You have these messages and basically you have the messages, you initialize it at time zero from uh, random numbers and you, you iterate that. And it's not uh, granted that it will always converge. So at some, in some cases, it does not converge. I should say, maybe I should mention one point that I always thought that BP is not only, I mean, in terms of uh, algorithm, it is used as iterative because it's fast when you try to solve it by iteration. But one might look at BP in other terms by looking at the fixed point equations of BP, the, these, these fixed points that you want to solve. You want to find the fixed point values how these messages, how all these equations that relate these messages, how are they, are they uh, satisfied to, together? So it is, it is in some sense in itself a problem of constraint satisfaction. That is, you have these messages and you want them to be compatible. You want them to satisfy this BP equation at each vertex. And, uh, and so, you, so you could look at it from this other point of view, not only relying on iteration of BP, but relying on other methods. And uh, this has not been explored very much, and I think it's an interesting uh, perspective. Okay, uh, so thank you, Mark. Now we have two questions from uh, Sébastien Verrel. Uh, many thanks for the high quality of your talk. In the, sorry, the question is, in the hard phase, have we got a conjecture on the energy of local optima? Um, the, yes. The, the replica and cavity method can give you some uh, distributions on some distribution of the energy of the lo local minima. It will tell you uh, basically indications of what is the number, what is the typical number of local minima at a given energy. Uh, this uh, number of minima, I should say, scales exponentially with the size of the system. So it is e to the n times an entropy. And you can look at this entropy, you can compute this entropy as a function of energy. It will tell you this, I was showing before this band of metastable states, and it will tell you where there are the, the metastable states are the most numerous. Okay, thank you. And the second question by uh, Sebastian was, can we use quantum computers to accelerate the server propagation algorithm? Ooh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, as soon as soon as as we build a quantum computer, I try to use it for that. But at the moment, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, my bet is that for long, still for a very long time, the the, the um, classical algorithms will uh, will be better. But it might be that uh, no, I don't want to go too much into conjectures. Uh, the, 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 the real answer is that we have not really thought uh, of that. There is one kind of generic approach to it, of course, which is uh, uh, quantum annealing. Quantum annealing is, is a very generic way of doing things in which basically uh, you have this, uh, in terms of satisfiability, you have these variables which are in two state, true or false. I, point it up or down because I am a physicist and I like to have speeds which point up or down. Mm -hmm. And basically you transform, transform that, that would be the SZ component of the spin. You, you add the other components of the spin in a, in a quantum group setting and, uh, and there is a kind of in quantum interpolation. It seems that in general, there will be, there will be a problem in doing the, the quantum annealing. 
So even if you have a good quantum computer, it will not be obvious that it solves the, uh, this um, SAT uh, problem uh, polynomial. So I think there is a lot of work to be done on that. I'm, I'm not, uh, not aware of uh, breakthroughs in that. OK, and, and uh, a very related questions by Bill Langdon. Uh, today we have uh, computers with thousands of GPUs, cores, etc. Can a BP can be run in parallel? Um, yes, kind of. It's well, you are. I'm sure there is in this audience many people who are more experts than me on on this aspect. But uh, BP can be largely parallelized because BP is uh, is basically um, a local iteration algorithm on graph. So basically, you can uh, you can do independent iteration. If I have a message which is here on this part of the graph and another message which is on another part of the graph, I can update them simultaneously. So basically, what you can do is you can divide your your graph into some parts which do not interact, and uh, and you update all the messages of that part, and then the next step you upgrade all the other messages. So okay, I'm hand waving it, but uh, uh, this. Uh, Basically, at a, at a high level, let's say the answer is yes. So by Anne Vandenberg, a very general question. Do you think that the hardest SAT instances for whatever algorithm are likely to show up in large on the my ensemble? Hard here meaning taking a long time to solve exactly. Because this would have consequences for benchmark sets and benchmark generators. Uh, sorry, Mark. I, I can, can you repeat the question? I could not understand it. Okay, sorry. Uh, my connection is really lousy. So it's a question: Do you think that the hardest SAT instances for whatever algorithm are likely to show up in large on the taking a long time to solve exactly? Well. Um... I think that uh, this this had been okay. This had been studied, for instance, by people like uh, Selman, Selman and Kirkpatrick, Levesque, Mitchell, etc. That at least, if you take random SAT formulas, it is very clear that the hardest uh, formulas are the ones which are close to the SAT and SAT phase transition. Uh, so it's cl close to alpha C that it becomes really hard to solve that. Uh, do they build so and for a long time, it was supposed that this would be the kind of, a, a kind, I mean, this was invented as a generator of hard set formulas. Uh, it is still partly the case if you are very close to the, to the set and set transition, but uh, the window of hardness has, has, has become uh, much smaller because these message passing algorithm have been a, are able to find solutions for very large set formulas relatively close to the threshold, not right at the threshold, but close to it. Um, whether there are, there are uh, structured, uh, whether there are other generators of structured SAT formulas, not random ones, which are harder, uh, this I, I don't know, but uh, it, might, it might be the case. But uh, at least initially, it was clear that the random SAT, it was, it was built, people got interested in that, because they found out that a lot of the practical set problems were rather easy to, to solve and they wanted to find hard instances. Okay, thank you very much. I think we already passed the deadline or the time limit. So we end the session. Thank you very much again, Mark. And uh, I didn't read all the messages that congratulate you for your brilliant talk. And I join my voice to these uh, compliments. Uh, there's no way I can uh, open the mic of everybody, but I'm sure we would hear some roar of applauses. Uh, so just doing myself applauses <laughs> and closing the session. And remember to attend this, you have to go now to Gather Town. Uh, you know where, because. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye bye.